Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The title of my study this morning is Showing Forth His Death Till He Comes. You need to keep in mind as we read this that there was a practice in the Corinthian church that we don't observe, and I don't know many churches that do. There was always a meal a common meal, a feast, and in that, part of that, then they had the Lord's Supper, the communion service. So part of what Paul is saying here, you need to keep that in mind. And so when they had the feast, they didn't always wait on the poor, and they didn't always provide for the poor. And then when they came to the communion service, he talked about judging yourself and specifically to them, not only judging yourself about many things, but judging yourself in the treatment of your brothers and sisters in Christ that they hadn't practiced very well. I remember years ago, Margie and I, we were invited to speak at this church up in the mountains of North Carolina, and it happened to be their homecoming. I didn't know that till we got there. And so we were invited to stay, so we did. But everybody just kind of divided up by families, and we didn't have anywhere to go. We hadn't brought any food, and and they just didn't really share with each other. And I thought, my, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. And to be there with no food and to be invited and then you're at in, in this uh, open pavilion that they had and everybody was dividing up, you know, I didn't see why they would even have a dinner and why they just stay at home. And if you're going to have a meal like that, you ought to, it ought to be a time of fellowship and not a family clique uh, that, and, uh, and I'm glad we don't have that and I think we need to learn to love one another more and more as we go. So I, I want you to follow me as I read, and I'm going to be begin reading in verse number 23 of First Corinthians chapter 11. It said, "For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said." Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, 
This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So he said in verse 24 about the bread symbolizing the body, his body do in remembrance of me. And then he said the same in the matter of the cup in remembrance of me. So we're talked to, we're, we're, we'll see about examining ourselves, and one of the things that you should keep in mind that what we do and which we will do today is it's in remembrance of Christ. So that should be part of our examining ourselves regarding the thoughts that enter our mind and our attitudes and and it is a special service. It is a day that he said as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so we need to always remember that. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death. You do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. And I'll mention this again in the message, but I want to clarify it right now. That's an adverb. It's not unworthy. It's unworthily. He's talking about the manner in which you take it and not your personal qualifications. So who of us are worthy of anything of the gifts of his grace? But let a man examine himself, and so let, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. <coughs> so just to say I'm not going to take it would actually mean the same as the manner in which he took it. Because he said there in that verse, he didn't give you an option. He said, examine yourself and then eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many are dead. This sleep's talking is a word for believers about death. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And I think he's going back to the meal, the common meal that they shared. In other words, have the courtesy to wait on your brother's and sisters. And he said, If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come together, that you come not together unto condemnation. In other words, if you're coming to that just to satisfy your hunger, you'd be better off to stay at home and eat. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So as we go through, I want to just look at some observations. Verse number 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, we use that for our text. Paul received instructions from Jesus Christ for the communion service for the church in the church age. So he had to see the Lord and talk with the Lord. And now... Christ was already crucified and already resurrected from the dead and already ascended back to the Father. That's why Paul said, I was one born out of due season. He saw the Lord. And I think you can find that as you study through the book uh, of Galatians. He did not say, I received a man, but for I have received of the Lord that which I am delivering unto you. So he had received of the Lord that which he has given out here and that we're looking at this morning. Paul was given more than one revelation of Jesus Christ in his life. Uh, I just want to mention three verses, Acts 9, 5, and he said, Jesus speaking, had, 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 had confronted Paul on the road to Damascus, and Paul responded, Who art thou, Lord? 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Galatians 1, 11 and 12 says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, in giving these instructions to Paul, takes Paul back to when he first instituted the Lord's Supper. The same night he was betrayed. I want us to first consider the significance of the Lord's Supper. This is the first reference to the communion meal in the New Testament. The account is given by Jesus directly to Paul. The bread is a reminder to the believer of the body of Christ. It was his body that was broken for us. Isaiah 56, 50 and verse 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 53, 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. We're talking about our Savior. We are healed. His flesh was ripped and torn by the scourging. Oh, what an awful time of suffering that he endured. I mean, you, if you can just imagine, and if you did some research in your study about how they prepared the scourging and how it was fixed to rip and tear and pull apart your flesh, and that's what he endured. His body was truly broken, but not a bone was broken. Not a bone was broken. Now, his bones were out of joint. He says in Psalm 22, my, jo my bones were out of joint. Now, you're talking about pain in addition to the scourging, but his body was truly broken. That body, his body, was the body that carried our sins. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's how he has made sin. For he hath made him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the rights of God. So God made his own son sin by putting our sin on him. The cup represents his blood that inaugurates the New Testament. Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That means there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. I want to read a few verses from the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9, if you'd like to make reference of uh, these verses. These verses, it's 9, chapter 9, verse 12, 14, 15, 24, and 25. So verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for you. Verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, which by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then verse 24 and 25 for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Oh, what a powerful verse. To appear in the presence of God for us. Remember when in our study we talked about in 1 John chapter 2, and verse number 1, we're talking about an advocate. And our advocate is Jesus Christ. And why is he our advocate? Because he himself is our propitiation is the satisfacting 
satisfying sacrifice for our sins. So you have an advocate with the Father, and that's Jesus Christ the righteous. In verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place every year with the blood of others. And so we get a little glimpse of the significance of the Lord's Supper. Number two, I want us to see the amazing love of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm not as perky when I receive bad news as I am when I receive good news. You know, bad news affects you different, doesn't it? I don't know of anyone that just rejoices in having surgery. I remember I called recently a, a person to have prayer with them. They're not a member of our church and before surgery, and they said, I'm scared. And I said, any sane person would be to have surgery. I mean, you, you think about it. Well, you just think about Jesus. And sometimes when we're pressing with bad news and burdens and things, we're not as sympathetic to other people because we're thinking about our own. That's human nature, you know. I imagine there are some people that don't do that, but I can't say that I don't do that. So here's Jesus. And before him is the cross. Before him is the suffering. He prayed, if, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but thy will be done. And all that was upon his mind. And in that night, that was the same night that he was betrayed. And in that same night that he was betrayed, he instituted the Lord's Supper. He instituted something of divine fellowship that we have down to this age and will have till he comes again. In Luke 22, he talks about it. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So we we'll think about the bread for a moment. In some denominations, some religions, they actually believe that the bread became the body of Jesus. But it's just a symbol of his body. It doesn't become his body so what is eaten is called bread. But at the same time, it is said to be the body of the Lord Jesus, showing that the apostle did not mean that the bread was changed into flesh. The bread eaten is a symbol of his body. In that night of being betrayed, it was his desire to eat this Passover with his disciples. He said, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I what suffer. Before I suffer. He knew the suffering, but yet there's his care. You know, the song, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Well, we were in his heart and on his mind in eternity past, but yet he came to be our Savior. He desired to do this before he suffered, and setting forth an example for us, but also the setting for this is found in John chapter 13, which is good to realize all those chapters in 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, they're there in John, you know, shortly before he was to go to the cross. So the focus is on Jesus as the only one who can guarantee or promise eternal life. And let me say this. 
Guarantee and promise are synonymous terms. His promise is his guarantee. Now think, he's the one that was to suffer and die for our sins. And yet he, and, and he stands before all these people and his disciples. And when he walked upon the earth, knowing that he was going to the cross and do all those things, and he asked for them to believe in him. So the focus is on Jesus Christ. The suffering that he suffered on the crucifixion was going to happen, but the focus was on him. Jesus is the Savior, and they were saved by believing on him. Just like all of those people that we read about, even Nicodemus, they were saved prior to the cross. So the focus is on Jesus Christ before he suffered the suffering of the crucifixion. He is the Savior. They were saved by believing in him. Everybody's always been saved by believing in no other way. The focus afterwards is now on Jesus Christ after the cross, but the promise is still the same. The people in the Old Testament were born again, just like we are today. I'm sorry a lot of people don't believe that, but they are, they were. So the guarantee is to the believer. Now listen to what John says in 524. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How could he do that? Because he's the Savior. People want to say, do I have enough faith? Uh, do I need to do this? What else? Do I, I've done all of that. And I, you know, you just need to believe in Jesus. That's the problem. He established a fellowship with us, the believer, that is to be carried out until he returns again. Look there in verse 26. He said, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Number three. We've looked at the significance of the Lord's Supper. We've looked at the amazing love of Christ as he instituted the, love, the Lord's Supper. And there, while he was going to the cross, before he was going to the cross, before he suffered, knowing that he would suffer, there's his compassion and love and grace to them. And he has that same love and compassion and grace for us here this morning. Now, verse 27 and I'd like for you to look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So he said, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So I want you to underscore, unworthily examine, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So many have health issues, and many have died, is what he's saying. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So I want to look at that first word I told you to underscore. And what was that word? Unworthily. Now notice it is unworthily and not unworthy. It is to be remembered that this word here is an adverb and not an adjective and has reference to the manner of observing the ordinance and not to the personal qualifications or fitness. For what gift of his grace are we worthy of? Well, none. We certainly are unworthy in every aspect of our life, but that is not what the Lord is talking about here. He is talking about the way you partake of it. 
So he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So one of the things you should examine yourself about, we all should, is remembrance of him. Our focus should be on Jesus. Number two, the teaching is that the believer is to examine and then partake. Number three, there was to be a distinction made between the meal and the Lord's Supper. Every passage in the New Testament regarding the Lord's Supper leads to the conclusion that it took place at the end of a social meal. And in the social meal, some poor believers were shunned and were not allowed to full fellowship. You can go back in chapter 11 to verse 21 and it says for in eating everyone taketh before him another his own supper and one is hungry and another is drunk and that's why I used the illustration about being at that church to speak on homecoming we didn't know it was homecoming we didn't bring any food of course we were living in Tennessee and that was in the mountains of North Carolina and the same thing took place with this church. There were poor people that didn't have anything, didn't bring much, but they weren't allowed. So there was this family clique, and everybody took care of theirself and didn't share with others. There should never be that type of attitude in the body of Christ, let alone in the local church. So he said, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? He said, I praise you not. He wasn't talking about communion service. He was talking about this meal that they had. Well, if they did that in that church, well, they didn't. They had a bad attitude. They, they, they wasn't right with their brother and, and sister in Christ. So. Paul condemned them for that. Number four, the one who does not examine himself eats and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So the next word that I had for you to underscore was discerning, discerning. So we looked at unworthily, and we looked at examine, and then he said, not discerning the Lord's body. So what does the word discerning mean? Well, it means to distinguish. So the one who does not examine himself before taking part of the Lord's Supper does not make a distinction between the communion service and the ordinary meal. That's what they were guilty of. And because of that abuse... For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many have died. So, let me say, we don't practice that here in having a meal and in the Lord's Supper. But we should examine ourselves and make a distinction about the communion service. He said, as often as you do this, you do show forth the Lord's death. He said, you do this in remembrance of me. We need to make a distinction. It is a special service. It is about the Lord. It's not about anything else. And so our minds and hearts ought to be, we ought to examine ourselves to see if that's the attitude that we have in thinking of this service. It's doing in remembrance of him. You, you, you think about him. In remembrance of him covers a lot of things, doesn't it? It would cover his life. It would cover his suffering. It would cover his scourging, his crucifixion. Remembrance of me. And as long as you do this, this is the only place in the Bible that there is that exhortation. So he established with Paul the carrying out of the communion service throughout the church age. And so that should always be a distinction in our mind. Remember, he's not talking about being worthy. 
he's talking about the manner. And so we ought to take time to focus our minds and hearts upon the Lord. It is a time of self-judging. Verse 31 says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we, the believer, judges ourselves, then we will not be judged by the Lord. If we're judged by the Lord, we will be chastened by the Lord. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So this chastening that he does is different. It's a healing chastening. Actually, I've heard it said and call as you think about the communion service and you think about all that's involved in it, it is a time that heals and blesses. So it's a healing chastening. It's a corrective, health-giving tonic, not an eternal condemnation. You are his child, and he wants you to walk with him. Verse 33 says, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. You know, it's, it's rude not to wait on your brother and sister in Christ and practice humility and kindness and grace. The conclusion of the whole subject, everyone is to wait till a fair and orderly distribution of the food was being made, and each is to remember that this is not an ordinary meal for the purpose of satisfying hunger, but the solemn commendation of the Lord's death, a meal for the purpose of satisfying hunger, had been, been best just to have been left at home. So that's what they were facing here, but we don't have that here. But we do have this communion service where we remember our Lord. And we do show forth his death till he comes again. So I want us to bow our heads and I want to thank all those who joined us by internet. And so if our heads are bowed and I want you to just spend some time with the Lord remembering Him examining ourselves about attitudes and feelings and just whatever the Lord brings to your mind. He said examine ourselves. So Lord, we do thank you for this communion service. And Lord, we remember you and thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for all that you did and the suffering that you did. And thank you for loving and caring for us. And thank you that you not only went and died was buried and resurrected. But Lord, you conquered death, hell, and the grave. And Lord, you gave this promise. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Lord, we thank you.